welcome to today's episode of Rock Art. We have in the studio with us one of influential personalities in our community, in the person of Jamie Highsmith. Great, and thank you for honoring our invitation. <laughs> well, Jamie, we invited you here to tell us a little bit about your career and also what you do for the community. But before we start, I would like to ask you, who is Jamie Highsmith Jr.? I support Brother in the struggle. That's it. <laughs> now, I, I'm born and raised in Rochester, New York, and uh, I was afforded the opportunity to travel around the world a little bit playing music, and I appreciated that. Uh, but I'm pretty much home now. I, you know, I started playing music at the age of 12 years. I started playing sax at eight years old and piano at six years old, but my first gig was I was 12 years old. I got paid 25 bucks over for somebody at a club wow. called Glass Onion back in the early 80s, and, uh, and that went from there to other opportunities uh, for me and to a record contract and being able to travel you know, around the world and play music and make a living. Uh, but there is a great need in our community for positive male role models. So in my later years, I, I spent more time at home really trying to mentor our youth, boys and girls, teaching them the man code, teaching them how to talk to women, how to raise themselves, how to be kings, and the young ladies how to be queens, how to be respected. And that's my most important thing right now, which is trying to get my community and talking to kids and just mentoring them. And music is a, to me, the universal language. It's my get in to, to, to the world. And through music, I can, I can take that and talk about life skills and, and things of that nature to better themselves as individuals. Well, you made mention that uh, music is like a universal language. What do you mean by that? I mean that, you know, you can go to other, co I've been to over 50 countries in my life. And I don't speak 50 languages, but I speak music. So whether I'm in Ghana, or I'm in Japan, or I'm in India, uh -huh. where we speak different languages, middle of C is always middle C. Do you follow me? So I can be in, I've been in other countries. I was in Russia once, and no one spoke English, and I didn't speak Russian. And I learned Dasvidaniya, but we played some jazz, because middle C is still middle C. So therefore, music is indeed the quintessential language. And music will invoke all emotions. Music can take you from a bad place to a good place if I lie. That is great to know. Well, um, you were native of <coughs> Rochester. Yes, sir. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, growing up in Rochester and when you compare those days to now, what has changed? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I grew up in the 70s. I was uh, born in the 60s, so right. And it really involved town that and knew a lot of jazz clubs and R&B clubs. You saw dance playing every night somewhere in Rochester, and that was a great scene back then. Not so much now. I mean, we have the Jazz Fest here, which is nice, but that's 10 days. Beyond that, it's hard for us to go and hear live jazz or a good R&B in Rochester anywhere. So that's a big change there. Um, I feel like the uh, you had Kodak, you had Xerox, you had the Rex Telephone back in the 80s. So mm -hmm. you had a lot of black families in particular who were doing well off middle class and upper middle class. And those jobs are gone now. So you're seeing this disparity of wealth within the inner city and the suburbs. suburbs. And that's changed for the worst. Poverty is terrible in Rochester right now. Wow. You know, and all that's changed since the 70s. Uh, there was issues back then also, but not like it is now. Uh, so, you know, I miss those times, but again, I still live in the inner city of Rochester. I live in the city of Rochester, not the suburbs. I'm invested, and it's my mission to try to make a difference and try to encourage these youngsters to greatness. Great. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, you said you started music when you were at the age of six. Piano first. Piano first. Yes. Can you tell me about that? That was interesting. That was my first experience with racism, actually. When I was six years old, I was in first grade, and there was a teacher at my grade school, another school, who taught piano. And at six, you don't know a whole lot about the vernacular of English, so she would call me her little nigger boy. I had a white lady, and I, I thought it was something endearing. Like, okay, I'm a little nigger boy. <laughs> Talked to my mother, who almost lost her whole mind. <laughs> so, wow. So, so, you know, the, the lesson stopped at that point, you know, and uh, later, Years later after that, I was in music class in Atlanta with Terrence Bruce, 
And then through subsequent for my music teacher, he bought a saxophone with him. And I was employed by his saxophone. Like, well, that's neat. I want to play saxophone. So my dad, I wanted to be a saxophone player. He got me a horn and got me lessons. I went to Hogstein's, went to Eastman. So I have a professional pedigree of music. I went to music conservatory. Oh. My folks s- saw fit to make sure I got the best opportunities I could to be the best musician I could be. So I appreciate them for that. Yes. Well, um, when I was doing a little bit of research, I realized that you are into, I mean, physics and meteorology. Yes. Why did you change your goal? How I didn't. <laughs> because I started playing music at such a young age, eight years old, that by age 12, I was a little bit talented enough to play gigs. So my folk had people come over to the house and guess, get your horn, boy, play a song for the, cable, for the people, you know. So I was like the entertainment. So music, for lack of a better word, was the path of least resistance for me. So music happened by accident. Yes, if I could go back in time, my children's career would be a NASA climatologist. I love physics. I love meteorology. I'm a complete science geek. But again, music, I was doing it for so long. It was a natural fit to do as a career. But I still very active with physics clubs and active with meteorology and other science geek stuff like that as well. Wow. <laughs> um, I believe your dad was into R&B and the jazz. My dad played jazz organ, yes. Did uh, and he really as well. influence you? He did. He did, along with my Uncle Alphonse Cousin of the group 1A Port. My grandfather played trumpet cornet with Lionel Hampton's band back in the 40s and 50s. And I got a cousin, Billy Easy, who plays sax today, who's toured with Benson and uh, a number of other great musicians. And uh, so I've been surrounded by music all my life. And uh, you were nominated for, I mean, Grammy Award. Yes, I got, what happened is, yes, I want to thank MySpace. <laughs> MySpace pre-Facebook, I had some, you had a, I just my face on engine to play your music. And I had just used the CD and had music on my on my MySpace that somebody from the Grammy Foundation well the Naris, they're the people who vote for Grammys, mm-hmm. heard the track and felt on the up the track to nominate it for the Grammy. Now the the way it works there are two rounds. There's an initial round where all the voting members vote for people to get a Grammy. Those votes go through. Those votes then move to the next level to win those rounds. And that level is the, li- the level you see on TV. I didn't make the second round and fourth. I made the first round. But I appreciate the fact that somebody who I did not know thought okay. enough of my music okay. to submit it for a Grammy nomination. You know, and that was cool to me. Because I don't, I didn't know them. I found it after that's what it was. And I appreciate that they, they, they did that for me. But uh, it was what it was. So Facebook, I mean, my success has happened to me. Great. Oh, uh, my next question <coughs> is, um, being a native of Rochester, mm-hmm. and now we have the problem in the city about the city school district, educational problem here. Yes. Uh, what is your take on that? Whew, it's funny. I just got asked to be the campaign manager for a friend of mine running for city school board, actually, in Illinois. We have a similar mindset. To me, I would like to see the district go back to what it was in the 80s, neighborhood schools. Right now, under Bush's, then this Bush 41, no, Bush 43, his enactment of the No Child Left Behind Act, I don't know how much split, either one of those two, it gave people school of choice. So you have people who live on Orange Street going to school at 28th School, or living on Carson Avenue going to 17th School across town. So here's the problem with that. So when we have parents teacher conference, if you have a single mother with four kids going to four different schools, or even one school across town, it's hard for her to make it to conferences. It's hard for her to be engaged in part of the school itself. You follow me? Meanwhile, you have all these buses running back and forth across town, half full because they're transferring all these kids across town like a like a grid back and forth. You know, versus having neighborhood schooling. Where with neighborhood schooling you could you could shorten the distance right now, I think it's two and a half miles, you have to live to get a school bus. Or with neighborhood schooling, it'd be a mile walk. So more people ride the bus that way. And now, if you live in the 33 school, you go to 33 school, you could walk there if you don't have a car. This can get more parent engagement. And the issue is that some schools perform better than other schools. I get that. 46 school, 23 school perform better than 17 school. Okay, fine. Whatever they're doing, replicate it in all the schools. So they all perform well, in my opinion. 
And then a limit school of choice, because all schools perform the same, and I have neighborhood schooling. And as for the high schools, I like to see them go back to the high, the high schools. To me, it's inherently dangerous to have a 12 year old girl and a bit of a 19 year old man. If you have high schools now, you have seventh graders and 12 graders in this building together. And there may be a 19 year old man and a building with a 12 year old girl. Literally, that, at East High in particular. That's dangerous. Not saying that's in particular, but the fact that a 19 year old man could be with a 12 year old girl in a hallway makes me uncomfortable. I see being that during high school. You go to grade school, you go to high school, and high schools. And I also like to see them bring back the alternative schools. So for the kids who need extra help who aren't capable of functioning in a normal high school realm, put them in a specialized school, pay the teachers more money to deal with those kids as well. So well, those are my ideas, which is pretty much how we did it back in the 80s. Well, um, <laughs> that, that is good. Um, viewers, we would like Jamie to play us as one of uh, your favorite songs. I'm going to play in honor of Black History Month. I'm going to play the Negro National Anthem. Negro National Anthem. Yes. Okay, so viewers, we'll be right back. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, during the break, I was thinking about this. Um, is there a specific program that you have for the city in not training the our young kids? Not at all. I just simply mentor. You just nothing, nothing official, no program. I just see a kid, I talk with a kid. That simple. Tell me about how people will be thinking, how are you doing this? Do you go to school to school or you go to the houses? You see a kid? Get Looks like they need to be talk, to be talk with them. I see them at a school bus, I see them at a school, I see them on the street, at a nightclub, at a store. You just, usually kids find me because of my, my local celebrity. You know, and say, hey, I want to be a musician, you know, what I want to do. And that opens the door to communication. But, I mean, you kids in your neighborhood, you, you live in a city, you see the kids, you can see their issues. Take the initiative to step up and say something to them. You put programs in place, some kids may not come to a program because that, that implies I have a problem. You know what I mean? Versus you see a kid in a barber shop or in a store on the corner hanging out and you just introduce yourself. Hey, how you doing? I'm Uncle Jimmy. They all call me Uncle Jimmy. And you talk with them. You have dialogue. That's the problem with society today. We don't have dialogue. We are so busy texting everybody on these little phones. We don't talk anymore. Half the problem with black and white in America is the fact we don't talk. We see somebody white assume they're racist, or a Trump lover, or whatever, and vice versa. If we have dialogue and get to know each other, 
it would change things. And oh, by the way, it's okay to agree to disagree. You don't have to always agree on everything. Just, okay, that's cool. I don't agree, but that's all right. We have to be friends. But at least have dialogue. You don't have dialogue anymore. Great. Well, uh, we went away from music. Yeah, we did. And uh, <laughs> uh, how did you make up your band? I mean, your team. I don't have a band. I hire musicians. <laughs> Point blank. I, I, I had bands in the past, and uh, having a band like having four wives. Because music, music is a very sensitive people. And the problem with having a band is that it implies a democracy. But when it's my band, it's not a democracy. It's a dictatorship. But then I give the music a lot of, a lot of um, latitude. And I respect their opinions. But at the end of the day, it's my marquee. If we don't get paid, I got to still pay them. I'm responsible because it's my band. So what happens is sooner or later, the musicians in the band sometimes feel stifled because they want to have more, in, more they want to have more decision in, in the end result, and that becomes uncomfortable. So therefore, I have no more bands. I just have I hire musicians. Okay. So I mean, uh, doing the research, I took certain names like uh, Dave, Mark, and Bruce. I see you guys play together yeah, all the time. Not anymore. They, we have them, but not anymore. Not anymore. No. I have I have guys I go to quite often, um, but they have their own band now, Dave, Mark, and Bruce. And uh, so I'm not using them recently on a YouTube gig, but I will in the future. You never know. I, I it's like a, it's a, I contract musician. You're a piano player. Hey, here's the gig, George. Here's the music. You play the gig? Yep, okay. You're on the gig, brother. That's simple. Uh, is there any reason why you guys are not playing together? No. Like I said, it's easier to hire musicians than a band because with a band, it implies a democracy. And that eventually causes a problem because people feel stifled because they want to do other things than the band leader wants to do. And at the end of the day, it's my decision. So in order to not have that happen, it's easy not to have a band at all. How many albums have you had so far since you started? This will be my 10th album coming out in April. Coming out in April. Yes. Uh, would you like to give us the name of your album? Black Cherry. Black Cherry. Why did you choose that? My father died last March. And this album is essentially a to my dad. His motorcycle was a Black Cherry Honda Goldwing. So every song has a to do with my dad. That's why it's called Black Cherry. Wow. <laughs> well, um, jazz festival is just around the corner. Yes, it is. Would you be part of it? I can't say. I can't say. They won't announce that until March. And if I say it now, it's a problem. <laughs> I can't say yes or no. I would say check my website. Okay, you will check your website. Check my website. Okay. It's www.jimmy, J I M M I E, Highsmith, H I G H S M I T H Jr. dot com. Great. Uh, if uh, other musicians are listening to you right now and they want encouragement or motivation to also be like you, what do you tell them? Practice and be sincere. You know, you want to be able to go out there. At any level you are, but be you, be sincere, don't be a gimmick. Find your sound, find your brand and template, point blank. Find what works for you. What What do you want to do? What's your brand musically? But it takes practice to get to that point. It's not something that happens tomorrow. You have to find what your brand is. Why should I buy your product if you're spending money yourself? That's true. You, you follow me? Yeah. Perfect example, I had a gentleman play guitar with me years ago. And he got really upset at me because he had a CD he recorded, and he recorded it and went to Kinko's, did a CD cover for it, and brought the CDRs, and he was selling a CD for $20. My CD was perfectly packaged, shrink wrap with a barcode. And so are the other musicians' CDs, except for his CD. He sold no CDs. He got mad. I said, bro, I'm not saying I sound like Nashi. Old David Sanborn or Darl Albright, but my CD will look as good as the CD in the store. You go in the store and see my CD, your CD, it's gonna look as good as your yeah, CD. Sure. It's about packaging, it's about imaging, it's about what you're offering. If it looks cheap, it may sound great, okay. but they won't mm. look Thank at it. They think it looks cheap. They think it's cheap. So invest in yourself. But before you do that, figure out what your brand is, and that takes practice. 
find your blend. What is your sound? And if you got that, stick with it and market it. When you said invest in yourself, are you talking in terms of academically or just invest in your music? Across the board. I'm talking about if you want to be a piano player, all right, invest some lessons, get some music theory, buy some great players to learn from, buy good gear. Don't come to the gig with toys from Walmart. Get a real keyboard. A Yamaha, I mean, a brand name professional keyboard. Because nothing more fun than a guy comes to the gig and they have these cheap keyboards and they break in the middle of the gig because they're cheap keyboards. You know, invest in your gear, invest in yourself. Part of the package. All right, if I want to get into music, would you advise a young one coming up to finish college before or it would be good for me to just focus on my music? Absolutely not. I mean, college is great. There's a lot of great music going to college and you know a lot of stuff in college but aren't good performers. They may have the book balance up here, but they're not good performers. I would, I, you're always gonna, I'm always learning music. I've not stopped. I'm, I'm gonna learn to day I die. Uh, but college to me isn't that for you, that's it for you being a musician. Look at Charlie Parker, he didn't go to college. John Cody didn't go to college. Practice. Learn the fundamentals. Get a teacher to teach you the foundational things you need to become a musician. Learn music theory. Learn your scales. Learn your instrument. And practice. And practice some more. And practice more after that. And continue to try to learn. But you got to practice and build your brand. What are some of the challenges you face <coughs> during your career? I mean, what are some of the challenges you face? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not a public speaker. That's one challenge. I'm dyslexic, so reading has been a challenge for me over the years. Reading music, you know, trying to find strategies to get over my dyslexia when I'm reading charts. The numbers, the, the notes change on me from my dyslexia. Um, you know, I mean, uh, no more everyday challenges, brother. Just uh, life, being in life, and dealing with life itself as a black person and a man. As a fat guy, <laughs> there's challenges, you know. It, it, everything, it's no different than anything in life. You always face challenges. The question is, are you going to persevere or give up? That's the question. Are you going to persevere and push through or say, I quit, I, I give up, I don't want to fight this fight. <laughs> you know, it's too hard. Too much work. I'm a black belt and oh. in martial arts. And the only difference between me and a white belt, I st stuck with it. <laughs> That's it. And being a black belt does not mean I'm a great fighter. I am, but does not mean that? <laughs> it just means I stuck with it. I didn't stop. Get it? Yeah. I make music. I make money playing music, but I stuck with it. I didn't stop. Would you like to tell us how many copies of your work have you sold? Okay. I have no idea. Thousands. I mean, I've sold, I'm on over 250 different albums. I'm other people's albums. I've done ten of my own albums, and I'm on several continents, several countries. I'm in. I'm on. I get a. I get a check every three months from iTunes, stuff like that. Wow. <laughs> so my earliest recordings go back to 2001. And the nice thing about jazz is that unlike pop music, I still sell tracks from my first album back in 2001. So I've sold thousands of CDs. I'm not a millionaire. Anymore. I'm not a. I'm not mogul rich at all. But I've done through thousands of CDs and thousands of CDs and songs over the last 18 years. Do you think technology has made a very huge impact on music? Without question, it's definitely changed things because back in the day you had N A and R, you had art development, you had um, you can come to a record label with nothing but talent and it would develop you and put you out there. Well, now with technology, Justin Bieber. He had a YouTube video and got a record deal. It's like that. You know, the internet has made people famous without doing anything. <laughs> you know. And now what's happened is that before a label will sign you, they want to see a video, they want to see your your media traffic, what your analytics look like. It, you know, you gotta have a bona fide media presence now before you look for a record deal. Because the, the media the social media is so important now. With the Spotify and the iTunes and all that stuff, you know, 
you know, and uh, I'm on all of that, which is cool. Uh, but yeah, you gotta, it's not like it used to be back in the day. And the record deal is not even important now, as much as distribution. That's important. Anyone get a record deal, but you want distribution. You want your CD placed in the store. You want it on the radio. Record deals don't have that happen. Record deals, unless it's a company that has distribution, that has the monies to work your album for the radio play. You follow me? Just because I, I don't want to say that word payola, but let's just say radio play is not cheap. <laughs> and you got to be connected. So you want to be with a label that has the power to work your album, or you have to in the play work your album. Most artists are independent artists anyhow. They have distribution deals. Well, um, when I was really young, I know that technology, YouTube, iTunes, and all that wasn't available. Yes. Now all these are available. It's Is not. it really distracting the business? Because you know what changed the business? The whole business has changed. It's not the way it was in the 80s or the 90s. It's totally changed. How do you guys make the money? You make the money from CD sales if you're independent artist and your concerts and if you get radio play. Radio play still pays decent money. Streaming sucks. Streaming is the worst. Streaming you get paid dot zero 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 three two per 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 uh, per stream. Spotify, I have a song that I wrote eighteen years ago. It's the quiet storm in the road. I wrote it for WTH radio station. Every night at 10 o'clock, Monday through Thursday, play my song as an intro to the Quiet Storm song on my first album. That has over a million, a million streams. So you think, wow, a million? I have not made a million dollars of that song. I have not. I may made a thousand bucks of that song, at best, because of the pay is so pathetic. So streaming sucks. What pays is digital downloads. That pays good money. iTunes, 60 cents on a dollar. That's not bad money because you figure to upload an album to the digital marketplace is like 30, 40 bucks. So once you sell 30 downloads, it paid for it at that point. So they charge you before uh, so you upload? Uh, upload fee. But then you're on everything. Of course, it's, it's, it's easy money. I upload it one time and I get paid forever. If they download my song, I get paid. Every single time I get paid. Well, I've seen some of your music, YouTube. Yes. So, example, someone who doesn't have the money will not go to iTunes to download your song. They will just go to YouTube. When you go to event, people bring their camera and video you. I know, and, and that's good and bad. I mean, it's good. And I, I, don't have, I don't have an issue with people recording my concert. I really don't. Um, I have a concert next month. Actually, it's April 27th. And it sold out last month. It sold out already. Wow. So I made my money already. Literally, it sold out. So I'm happy. Um, I don't have an issue with that. Some people do. I'm not that selfish. I know people can see my videos online and uh, and watch for free. Uh, however, some of my videos, if I get enough views, YouTube will pay me commercial. So I get money that way as well. To me, it's an opportunity to hit build my audience. S someone who might not know me already might see a YouTube video and not be a fan of mine, and that may get them to buy a CD or buy a song, download a song. You never know. To me, the good outweighs the bad. You're going to lose some. You know that. That's going to yeah, happen. Sure, yeah. But you can't worry about that. Do it's people fun. really buy CDs these days? Yes, they do. Oh. I have, I used to print about a thousand CDs and I used to sell a thousand CDs. Oh. And I sell my concerts and festivals. Because there are folks who want to buy a CD. They want to buy a signed CD. They want to read it in a the jacket. What do you mean by a signed CD? I sign it. Oh, cool. And I give it to them. And they want to read their line notes. They want to have a physical CD. Some people do, still. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, no problem, bro. We've talked a lot. <laughs> uh, is there anything that you think I did not ask you that uh, mm -mm. you will share with our listeners? No, not at all. I'm, I'm good, bro. Thank okay. you very much well, for thank coming, you, sir. Jimmy.
Lessons. And it's great okay. having you.